Hello and welcome to the podcast, Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path. I'm your host, Mike Allen. Recently, I learned about a fire, a big fire, in fact, the biggest fire ever of its type, and it happened in Hartford, Connecticut. The death toll was a staggering 186 people. You know, I couldn't believe I'd never heard about it, but it's probably because it happened 80 years ago in 1944, and it was at a performance of the Barnum and Bailey Circus, which made it an even bigger Connecticut story because, of course, P.T. Barnum was born in Connecticut. So I just had to learn more about this and went about reading articles and even going to the Connecticut State Library to look through their extensive files. And what I found was an almost unbelievable tale of intrigue. I also found one person who summed the whole story up pretty well in a single article. His name is Eric Offgang. He is a feature writer. He's currently working for Tech and Learning, but formerly worked for Connecticut Magazine. He's also an adjunct professor at Western Connecticut State University in Danbury and Quinnipiac University in Hamden. I am very glad he agreed to do this interview, and I enjoyed our talk. I call this episode The Day the Clowns Cried at the Worst Circus Fire in History. The official cause of the worst circus fire in U.S. history to this day is undetermined. But as feature writer Eric Offgang is going to tell us pretty soon, there is a tantalizing arson suspect who went uninterviewed by Connecticut authorities, even though they knew that he had confessed to it for 50 years. July 6th of 1944 was one of those Triple H days, hazy, hot, and humid. The event was on Barber Street in Hartford. That's where the Barnum and Bailey Circus came each year for a few shows. The street is in the city's north end. It's not even a mile long. Well, this particular year, the Flying Willendas were on the bill as a big attraction. They would come from Europe and featured specialists in trapeze and high wire acts. Also on the bill was Emmett Kelly, probably the most famous clown in history. And of course, they had all the other famous Barnum and Bailey attractions, the tamed animals, magic tricks, and whatnot. It was, after all, the biggest circus in the country and had the best acts. Well, even though P.T. Barnum had started the circus, by 1944, he had been dead for half a century. The 4th of July in the United States had just been celebrated, and indeed across Connecticut, and children were out of school for summer recess when the circus came to town. Now, in those days, the circus came to town for a couple of days. A train would bring it in, and all the kids would gather around to watch the big production. The setup would start with them bringing the wild animals in in their cages, then raising the big top tent, and then putting the grandstand bleachers inside the tent, enough to hold 9,000 people. After the shows, they took it all down, put it back on the train, and moved to the next town. In Hartford's case, the circus was supposed to be in for two days with four shows, afternoon matinee and an evening show, including the next to the last show, which was the afternoon matinee on Thursday, July 6th. The matinee that day had overflow guests. There was extra people there, you know, who had been planning to attend an earlier show. Now, the circus train had come in. It was in Portland, Maine, then Providence, Rhode Island, and then got to Hartford, and it was running late. Yeah, they missed the uh, the, the show the evening before, which is considered bad luck in circus lore. And indeed, it was very bad luck. Well, at that matinee, there were 7,000 patrons and overwhelmingly made up of mothers and children. The matinee got underway at 2.15 in the afternoon with the ferocious tigers up first. Well, they had just finished and the crew was loading them into their cages at the two rear exits of the tents. Then it was the flying Willendas who were already actually entertaining the crowd on the high wire. And in fact, it was just 20 minutes into the show, a little bit after 2.30, when the fire broke out. Circus band leader Merle Evans was said to be the first person to spot the fire. The flames were still small, but the side of the tent was engaged. So he had the band strike up the song Stars and Stripes Forever. Now, in the circus, they called that the disaster march. It was a signal to circus staff whenever they heard that, that a significant problem was underway. Ringmaster Fred Bradner heard the song, and he turned around and saw the flames. And he called for people to stay calm and begin to file out. 
Well, unfortunately, the electricity had gone out and nobody could hear him on his microphone. I'm going to stop here for a second and tell you about how the Big Top tent was treated in those days. Treated meaning that they made it waterproof, not fire resistant. They treated it with a coating, and it was a chemical reaction that bonded this coating to the fabric and made the tent waterproof. The chemistry behind it? 1,800 pounds of paraffin wax, which is the same thing that candles are made from, and 6,000 gallons of liquid gasoline. You put that mixture together, submerge the tent inside, and what happened at the end was that the wax bonded to the tent surface and it covered all the sides and the top. Well, the problem is there's only a couple of exits in the tent and two of them now are blocked by tiger cages. Some of the circus workers are trying to douse the flames with some nearby jugs of water and of course that proved useless. Then they tried to help the patrons leave. The flames were spreading quickly to the top of the tent, and soon the entire tent was consumed in flames. What followed, of course, was pure chaos. First, there was the dripping hot paraffin wax coming down from the top of the ceiling that was burning patrons. Next, entire pieces of the burning tent started to fall on patrons. Smoke was billowing everywhere, making it hard to see and hard to breathe. There was the stampede of panicked people pushing the people in front of them to the ground and trying to walk over them and trampling them to death. Thousands of people were screaming, and witnesses said the worst of all was the screaming children. In the grandstand seats, if you were trying to get out, you were blocked, so a lot of people went back up to the top of the grandstands, which also happened to be closest to the burning ceiling. They would jump off the grandstand into the hay below, and sometimes that hay was on fire, and they would get burned doing that. Sometimes they injured themselves when they jumped, and they fell right in place and couldn't move any further and were trapped to die. Evacuation through the exits was extremely difficult. The two rear entrances blocked by the tiger cages and the front entrances blocked by, unfortunately, the bodies on the ground. There's a story of one young man who had a pocket knife with him. He tore a hole in the tent, grabbed a patron by the arm, and they escaped. The whole thing really only took about eight minutes. Flames had engulfed the entire big top tent. It collapsed on the hundreds of patrons who were still trapped inside. The net result, 186 persons were killed. That's the official death toll, although many believe it was higher. Most of them died from smoke inhalation. Some were trampled, some were burned, some beyond recognition. Now, one of the people in the tent that day who escaped was a man with two very important jobs, particularly when you talk about this fire. His name was Edward Hickey. He was the commander of the Connecticut State Police, and he was the Connecticut Fire Marshal. Incredible that he held both titles. He had brought his nieces and nephews to the circus that day, and they managed to escape. They were one of the lucky ones, but they saw and heard all the horrors of that day. Well, to summarize Hickey's ensuing investigation, he ruled the fire was accidental. He said it was caused by a cigarette, and it was thrown by a patron into the hay by the side of the tents. Five circus workers were charged with manslaughter for alleged safety violations, although there clearly were fire safety issues with all circuses in those days. There was straw everywhere under the tents and the grandstand seats, and you could smoke cigarettes, so it was no big deal, and they used to put out fires all the time. Well, four of those five workers ended up going to jail, and the Barnum & Bailey Circus put aside $4 million for the victims, which covered things like funeral costs and victim compensation claims, all of this above and beyond life insurance payouts. There emerges kind of early on this idea that the state of Connecticut wants compensation for the victims, which is worthy. You know, a lot of people um, died, a lot of children died. Many of them were, you know, middle class or lower middle class. So, you know, money, well, it, it, it can't undo the terrible tragedy they, they endured, you know, could help the uh, victims in, in other ways, of course. Um, so the state, you know, wants to kind of place the blame, um, and, and and again, with some good reason, on, you know, Barnum and Bailey, and they're saying, you know, you did this. Well, Barnum and Bailey said it was arson. They said they had proof, and they would bring the evidence into court. But that never actually happened, and it speculated that because the political overtones of fighting such a case in public with so many dead mothers and children would have just been untenable at that time. Well, meantime, World War II ended. We had great economic prosperity in the U.S., and 
You know, as time went forward, the Hartford Circus Fire became something that people just kind of wanted to forget. And that's pretty much where it stayed for six years. Now, nobody, of course, wanted to hear the talk of arson at the circus, but what if the arsonist himself talked about it? Well, fast forward to 1951 in Ohio. A series of arson fires occurred. Investigators identified a suspect. That suspect confessed, but he also implicated his roommate, Robert Segui. In fact, he said that Segui told him that he had started the Hartford Circus Fire. Reading some of the reports, my impression is that at first they were kind of like, well, this sounds implausible. Um, you know, false confessions are common. There had been a previous fire at one of the uh, circus's shows, and that had had a, a person who confessed falsely to it. So, you know, it was, it was a high-profile crime. So they, they kind of reacted like, well, this can't be possible. But they started, they met with Sagi and looked into his history. And when they did that, they found that, like, actually, he was with the circus at that time. You know, he had joined up in Portland about a week before and had left right after the Hartford Circus fire. So they realized that it was possible that he could have done it. Well, Sagi was brought in for questioning by Ohio authorities, and he admitted to several fires in Ohio. He also said he killed some people in New England when his family had lived there. And yes, he confessed to starting the Hartford Circus Fire. I call it a confession. I should clarify that it's not quite a confession. He always kind of left like a little bit of an out, like if I did it, I would have done it this way. It's almost like always like a borderline confession. Well, Ohio authorities indeed called it a confession. And that story, as you can imagine, made headlines nationwide because after all, the Hartford Circus Fire, having been the biggest circus fire in U.S. history, was well known across the states. Now, confounding the confusion was that Segui would then recant his confession. He said that, yeah, he doesn't remember it that way after all, and this despite all the circumstantial evidence surrounding him. Okay, so now let's go back to Edward Hickey. Let's say you're him. You want to get right out to Ohio and interview Segui, right? Hickey and other Connecticut authorities, they seem like they should be working closely with the Ohio authorities, but they have their relationship just gets really contentious early on for reasons that aren't clear. And so you have the two states looking into Sagi's background, investigating. He's held by Ohio authorities, so Connecticut never gets to investigate, to, to meet with him, uh, Connecticut authorities, but they go to Portland, Maine, and other places he had lived in New England, and they're they're conducting separate investigations. Some people look at it and say Hickey and his team was kind of, it looks like they were in conducting a cover-up investigation. I didn't see that, you know, from what I was reading. It looked like in a way they were doing a thorough job in some ways, but there's no denying that the the lack of cooperation between the two states just really hurt the investigation. And there was also a strange Dismissive might be too strong on a word. If it happened today with a similar scale tragedy, you can't imagine, um, you know, a Connecticut investigator um, behaving in that way. It, it's almost as if they felt like we need to check this out, but this this is incredible. Well, a lot of people, frankly, were scratching their heads over the state's action or inaction. Robert Segui was never interviewed by state officials, at least not for half a century. So here you have the state police commissioner and the state fire marshal, same person, at the circus that day with his nieces and nephews, and they see all that horrible stuff happen. And then if you find out that maybe somebody deliberately set the fire, one might think that he'd want to get to the bottom of it and make sure that person faced justice. Well, Eric says there was one reason that that did not happen. There's at least a perception that if you prove it's arson, that then the victims aren't as entitled to as much money or somehow that um, changes the financial situation. And, and that's where some of the, the thinking that the state of Connecticut wasn't as interested in looking at Sagi as they otherwise would have been comes in. Interesting. And not to mention it would have been uncomfortable for the circus to admit that they had workers setting fires. Yeah, for sure. I, I think the circus also, there is a sense that perhaps that would exonerate the circus in one way, but you are correct that it, it wouldn't really look great for them if they brought in, um, you know, an arson 
And then enter Rick Davey. So this is uh, another unbelievable chapter in all this. Uh, what what can you tell me about Rick Davey? So Rick Davey was a Hartford fire investigator. And in the 1980s, he is doing a talk for local school children in Hartford. And they ask him about the Hartford circus fire. And he really doesn't do, know anything about it. Um, and he um, is kind of embarrassed by that and starts to look into it. Well, Davey spent years reviewing all of the documents, some of which I had looked at at the Connecticut State Library. He was poring over all the old records and the witness interviews and talking to whoever he could, survivors or family members of the deceased. He focused very heavily on this near confession by Robert Segui. And what was his conclusion? He sees more of, you know, like a true cover-up. That's his impression, that Connecticut is looking to kind of cover their bases and stop this from spiraling out of control. The rationale Davey believes they have for that is that because several million dollars have already been paid out to victims' families based on the circus being negligent, if they find out that it was arson, that could threaten that. This second look by Davey had a lot of credibility with the public. He knows how these type of crimes are investigated and you know raises serious concerns. So he starts, you know, in the 1980s, early 1990s, he starts to get much more interest in this and this idea that this was never investigated the way it should be. Um, and we need to take a closer look at this. Now, he's smart enough to know that it's not going to get, you know, covered over by uh, officials if he goes to the Hartford Current, too. Yes. And he and he goes to the press. There's a series of articles that are written about it. and. Ultimately, state police fire investigators, Sergeant James Butterworth and Detective Bill Lewis end up going to Ohio to meet with Segui. So off they go to Columbus, Ohio, to meet with Robert Segui. Now, Segui was just a teenager, 13 years old when that fire broke out, working in the circus in the lighting department of the circus. Now it's 1993, nearly 50 years after the fire. Segui is 63 years old. He had spent time in jail in Ohio for the arsons there. So how'd that interview go? He was very eager to talk with them, and he was a very unusual person. He talked about, you know, um, having visions of other realities, and he talked about his Native American heritage, even though as far as the investigators could tell, he didn't have any indigenous heritage, um, but he believed himself to be a a Native American shaman, and we talk about fires that happened 400 years ago. And as far as his time in Hartford, he says he was at a movie, that he, he set up the lights that morning, then left the circus grounds and went to a movie. And he says he's at this, the movie The Four Feathers. But The Four Feathers isn't playing in Hartford that day, which, you know, it's years later. Maybe he saw a different movie. Maybe what, there was a, a preview. You could be forgiven for forgetting what movie you saw on a certain afternoon many years later. Well, you know, of course, in this country, we do have that standard of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Turns out it was almost impossible for investigators to nail down anything with certainty in that kind of setting, especially because of the constant memory lapses on Segui's part. But the story got even stranger with the introduction of an imaginary third party. They're left without much to go on. He, he doesn't reconfess. He says that it, the original so-called confession was untrue, that he was more coerced to say it. Um, he doesn't use that phrase. And maybe that, again, that's maybe a little strong, but he says he didn't set the fire. He wasn't there. He doesn't know what happened. And Butterworth and Lewis are left without enough evidence to take the investigation any further. Now, let's take a look, though, at what he told Ohio authorities, which, of course, years later is very tough to corroborate, especially when he's denying it, but about the red man. Yes, yeah, so he says he sees these visions of a red man who comes to him and tells him to burn things, and that he, he um, you know, it, his stories kind of change and evolve over time, but, you know, the red man's kind of a constant. He draws pictures of him, um, and he tells him to set the fire um, in Hartford as well as, you know, other crimes. 
he's committed. And when he talks about it, he always forgets. You know, he he always has a story where he's got a match in his hand and he's walking towards the tent and then he wakes up and the fire started. So he never, you know, getting back to what I was kind of saying earlier, he never quite says, I started the fire this way. He, he always has like a gap in his memory. Now, it's interesting in your article. In fact, I wanted to just quote this because, you know, I kept as I was reading on, I was like, well, the guy obviously has some sort of emotional difficulties. What are the psychologists saying? And you write, one psychologist examining him believed he had done the things he said he did, but noted, quote, he is often confused and sometimes his accounts of the same incident may vary, but the variation is unintentional. That just sounds like an impossible situation to to crack. (laughs) Yes. And that's what the investigators who met with him in 1990, you know, felt that it was just really hard to make any headway. It was difficult to tell if he was lying or telling the truth because he definitely is a person who, because of his obsession with Figer and um, his unusualness, his um, strange beliefs, you could can, can see him as someone who set the fire. But at the same time, you could also see him as someone who, you know, he loved to talk. You could tell that on the interview later, um, even though, again, you know, it probably you know, if a lawyer was advising him, they might have told him not to or only speak with a lawyer present. But he he liked to talk. So um, you could also see him being someone who, you know, told people interviewing him what they wanted to hear or what he thought they wanted to hear. Well, Robert Segui would die four years later without ever reconfessing. In fact, Connecticut investigators had even left their card with his daughter saying, look, if he has a change of heart, please call us. She never did. Well, you know, that's a pretty good story if it ends right there. But there is more, in fact, a lot more. And it starts with Michael Skidgel. Michael was a regular citizen, just like you or me, who just frankly couldn't believe what he was seeing or reading and set out to become one of the foremost experts on the circus fire. He set up a Facebook page for survivors, and he maintains a list of every person known to be killed. He wrote a book called, of course, The Hartford Circus Fire, and it chronicles the blaze and all of the subsequent investigations. Well, Eric Offgang met with Michael, and Michael kind of pointed him in the direction of a statement given to police by a Red Cross nurse, Martha Menard. Martha had been at Hartford Hospital the day of the fire. Yeah, so she is a, um, she's working at the local hospital, and this man comes in, Harry Lackin, and he is acting very strange. He says, you know, quote, I'm not squealing. And later, I never knew it would be like this. And I don't know that I can take it. And he's got this reddish appearance to his skin. It sounds like someone who maybe just was survived burned or was an escape from a fire. But he's unlike maybe other victims. He seems not just disturbed by what happened, but seems to, at least in Mrs. Menard's understanding, he seems to be like he saw something take place, something wrong beyond just the fire starting, but something some, something criminal. She is disturbed enough to report what she's seen to the authorities. And they find out later that Harry joined the circus at the same time that uh, Sagi did. Yes, and worked in the light department. So that starts to look strange. Well, the suspicions swirling around Portland, Maine members of the lighting department crew in the Barnum and Bailey Circus took yet another strange twist. There was another man who also joined the circus in Portland at the time that Sagi did, named Roy Tuttle. And after the fire, he disappears, and he's apparently burnt very badly and decides to walk home to Portland, is the story he tells, that he walks home and that he rests when his burns hurt too much. He goes into, like, lakes or streams and just goes into the water and then eventually gets back to Portland. And so investigators are looking around. They can't find this guy. They find him in Portland. And apparently, by his story, he was known to be sort of a strange character in Portland. He was a vagrant. He was obviously, um, you know, an unusual guy. Um, So maybe, you know, again, it's it sounds kind of bizarre, but maybe it's could could have happened that way. Um, what's interesting to me, though, is that all three of them, Sagi, Lackin, and Roy Tuttle, they all joined the circus in Portland about a week before the Hartford Circus fire. And afterwards, 
independently, they all arouse suspicion in different ways. Now, it should be mentioned that there were reports that Roy Tuttle had initially told the hospital caregivers who treated him in Maine that he knew how the fire started. But when the Connecticut investigators got up there to speak with him, he didn't mention anything about that. So here we are 80 years after the fact, and we're still talking about the Hartford Circus fire. Why? Well, Eric Hofgang has some interesting takes on this, and he says there are at least three good reasons. To me, the question of whether whether it was arson or an accident is really important because it changes um, you know, a terrible tragedy into a terrible mass murder. And it, it would be um, the biggest mass murder in Connecticut history, one of the biggest mass murders in U.S. history. You know, it really changes the nature of um, the tragedy. And then, of course, there's always our fascination with the circus, right? Obviously, the circus is sort of um, one of those American institutions that is drenched in nostalgia and, you know, continues to fascinate us above and beyond, you know, any tragedies that occur. So, you know, you talked about Barnum, you know, he's obviously one of those figures that, you know, we're, we're drawn to, you know, much like we are to Houdini or Babe Ruth. He's just this classic American figure. So the circus has, has a lot of that. And finally, you know, as far as the state police are concerned, the case may be closed, but for some, it is still, frankly, very much open. You know, the identifications of the bodies um, and many of the victims is still un- ongoing. There are still unidentified victims, and there's still a lot of questions around, you know, whether there were misidentifications at that point. Um, so the Hartford police over the last couple of years have done different genetic tests with relatives. I believe there's five or so unidentified um, bodies still. They're trying to figure out who they are. Um, Mike Skidgel, one of the circus historians, he believes that early on they misidentified a fair amount of the victims so that right now it's really difficult to piece together because they're trying to sort of match the unidentified with the unidentified bodies, but that's not necessarily the best way to do it. One of the saddest stories of this entire saga was of this little girl known by a number She was younger than 10 the day she died, and she was never identified. The number was the number assigned to her at the morgue. Her photo was somewhat gruesome, but it was nevertheless published in papers around the region. Authorities were hoping that somebody would come forward and recognize her. Well, after fire investigator Rick Davey did his deep dive, he got agreement among authorities that it was 8-year-old Eleanor Cook. Some hair samples and DNA testing was examined. Her brother Edward had died in the fire that day. Her remains were exhumed from the grave as a result, and she was then reinterred next to her brother. Well, unfortunately, there's an ongoing dispute to this very day as to whether she really is Eleanor. Relatives at the time had said, no, it was not Eleanor. We may never know for sure. Well, if you go to the back of the Fred D. Wish Elementary School on Barber Street in Hartford, you'll be standing on the very spot where that fire occurred. Now, today there's a small monument there honoring the victims. There's a photo of the big top tent in flames and the names of all the victims. Now, personally, my journalistic instincts keep me from sharing my personal opinions most of the time. When I was a reporter for 15 years, I didn't allow myself to have personal opinions because my job was to report the facts to my audience and let them decide. So if I thought Robert Segui was guilty back then when I was a reporter, I couldn't say it. It Turns out now my conscience won't let me say what I think, even though I'm no longer technically a reporter. But that's okay. You should make up your own mind anyway. wraps up this episode of Amazing Tales from off and on Connecticut's beaten path. If you like this show, I'd ask you to do two things. Number one, make sure you follow the podcast wherever it is you get your podcasts. This way you'll be notified when the next episode is coming and usually one comes out every week. The second thing I'd ask you to do is tell your friends. And if they don't know what a podcast is or how to listen to one, help them out. 
Turns out about half of all Americans don't understand what a podcast is yet, and they don't use this technology. Also, I make appearances and talk about the topics that I discuss here on Amazing Tales. I'll do them in person or by Zoom, depending on where you're located. I'd be happy to discuss an appearance in front of your group. So if you're interested, just email me at amazingtalesct at gmail.com. That's Amazing Tales, the letter C, the letter T, at gmail.com. Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path is a production of True North Associates, LLC. This is Mike Allen. Be safe and stay healthy. Thank <laughs> you.